Good evening. My name is Professor Lorraine Brennan and I'm delighted to welcome you all here tonight to the third talk in our 2024 public lecture series in food and health. The purpose of these lectures is to provide you with the most up-to-date scientific knowledge on topics of food and health that are of interest to the public. Tonight's lecture is on the topic of making foods healthier and I'd like to introduce our two speakers. I'd firstly like to thank them both for taking up the time tonight and coming along tonight to share their knowledge with us. So tonight we have Professor Breege McNulty and Sinead O'Mahony. Breege is an Associate Professor in Human Nutrition in the School of Agriculture and Food Science in UCD. And over the last 16 years, she's been involved with the National Food Consumption Surveys in Ireland, which has collected detailed dietary data and lifestyle data across all age groups in Ireland. Her research focuses on using such data to gain an understanding of the impact of foods, nutrients, food ingredients and chemicals on health with a view to underpinning food safety and policy. And she has contributed and published over 100 research articles in the area. Sinead is the Re for Food Reformulation Task Force Manager at the Food Safety Authority of Ireland. And she's also a PhD candidate in the Institute of Food and Health at UCD. Sinead is a Koro registered dietitian and holds a master's in public health and health promotion and her work on food reformulation task force and her PhD focuses on measuring the healthfulness of the food environment and implementing strategies to improve its healthfulness. At the end of the talk, if you if you have questions or actually during the talk as well, if you have any questions, could I ask you to put them in the Q&A tab and you'll see that at the bottom of your screens. One really important aspect of these public lectures is that we give time for you to ask questions and both our speakers tonight will answer those at the end. So I'm delighted to welcome both Sinead and Breege tonight and now I'm going to hand over to Breege to get started. Thanks Lorraine, I'm just going to share my screen. That's okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, yeah, so the the topic of of today or this evening's lecture is 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 making foods healthier. And I suppose to get started, I wanted to really, I suppose, set the scene and put everything into context. And um, then I'm going to let Sinead take over um, halfway through to kind of go through what we're doing, I suppose, in Ireland in terms of making foods healthier. So why is there a need to do this? Well, we probably all know and all realize that diets are linked in terms of our health and that actually unhealthy diets are a risk factor for many diseases and actually is the leading risk factor for the global burden of disease. And these diseases are NCD diseases um, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes and cancer. And so with that, what we should understand is because diets are related to it, and the food that we eat, we actually can do something about this. We can actually change um, our diets, uh, change the foods and therefore have an impact. And it's important to, to understand that because when we look at the causes of death, and this is just taken um, from our world and data and looking at the causes of death worldwide um, in 2021, we can see that NCDs are the highest cause of death globally. So this is on a global basis. Um, and we can see CVD there is at the top um, and below that is cancer. And then we have diabetes a few further down. Um, so we can make a difference to this. And we can go a bit further to, in terms of looking at that, um, looking at global death, but looking at the risk factors for global death. And that's that here. So it's, a, it's another um, uh, figure from our world and data. And they've looked at this and estimated the annual number of deaths can, attributed to each of these risk factors. And you can see the list there. But if we just look at the ones highlighted in the red boxes, we can see that our diet does make a difference. So if we have diets that are low in fruit, low in whole grains, low in nuts and seeds, low in vegetables, um, and have a higher alcohol use, then that actually increases um, our risk of death. Equally, if we look at the ones in orange, and although they're not diet per se, diet does have an effect on each of them. So we can see in terms of high blood pressure, sodium is related to that or salt intake, high blood sugar is related to carbohydrates, sugar intake, and high cholesterol in terms of fat intake, and then ultimately obesity. 
So obesity is about, I suppose, energy balance. And we can look at it in that way that it's related to our diets as well. And if we delve a bit further um, into it and just look at iron and look at obesity levels, just to put, I suppose, where we're at in all of this, because that's globally, we do have a higher a high prevalence of obesity in Ireland. So this is three graphs. It's just looking at children in the blue, uh, adolescents in the purple and uh, adults in the orange. And it's looking from 1990 onwards. And it's based on different national food consumption surveys that we've done throughout the years. And as you can see, I suppose the prevalence has increased. And at some point in the children's and in the uh, adults, in the recent data, we can see a slight decline. However, levels are still really high. And we can see in similar case in the adolescents, that prevalence is still increasing. And we can see it's the highest rate um, in the last survey in the NF NTFS2. So we need to do something about it. And we can look at that in terms of obesity and energy balance. And this is a graph just looking at energy balance. And that's very looking at it very simply. And I do understand obesity is multifactorial and I'm not going to go through all the factors, but we really want to focus on foods here and looking at the food we consume. And that's obviously providing us with energy intake. And if that food provides us with too much energy and we don't use it up, we accumulate mass. We accumulate fat mass and that's weight gain. And if we don't expend that energy and have it within our bodies, and um, that can relate to uh, or lead to a risk of chronic diseases and illnesses, such as the ones that we outlined uh, earlier. So we really need to look at this energy intake and this food consumed. And what is the recommendation or how do we do that? Well, on a public basis, we have these food permits. Uh, this is one that we have in Ireland, and it's designed to try and uh, formulate that balance. So it provides uh, the population with the amount of servings that we should have of different food groups. And within that, we can see that the actual pyramid not only is trying to balance all of that out, but it's trying to limit those fats in terms of saturated fats, in terms of sugar, in terms of salt, but actually intake those healthy nutrients they want to see more of in our diets. And that's our whole grain or fiber. So based on that, where are we at or what are we doing in terms of the Irish population? Are we meeting these recommendations? So we look into that a wee bit further and we can do that in looking at these national food surveys that we've done. And the most recent one um, that's published just in 2023 and that's looking at um, adults and that's in from the National Adult Nutrition Survey too. And this is just looking at our energy intakes. And what we can see is this is the type of macronutrients or carbohydrate or total fat and protein that provides that energy intake. And if we break down, we can see that 37% of our energy actually comes from a fat source. And this is higher than we would like to see. The recommendation is to have it below 33% food energy. And actually carbohydrate is slightly too low. We're only seeing 44% and we would like to see it around 50% or higher. So we need to change that type of uh, macronutrient profile that we're seeing in terms of where we're getting our energy from. Protein is probably all right at 19%. So if we look at carbohydrates and fat in a wee bit more detail, and break them down, firstly, looking at carbohydrates. So we can look at carbohydrates and carbohydrates. One of those is, is sugar and sugar provides us with energy. Um, and we can see that we're getting about 17 to 18 grams per day on average adults from a, in terms of sugar content within the, in their diets. And that's slightly higher than what we would like to see. On the other hand, um, also uh, from our carbohydrate sources is fiber. And we can see that on average, we're getting about 18 grams per day in either 19 to 64 year olds or over 65 year olds. And that's way below where we would like to see it. We actually need to have that up at 25 grams per day or over. So we're actually not getting enough fiber. So although we're not getting enough carbohydrates, we're actually even not getting enough of the quality carbohydrates that we would like to see. If we look at fat, in the same instance, we're trying to reduce that saturated fat. So saturated fat, we know is the, I suppose the, the, the fat that we want to see less of in our diets and unsaturated, like your, uh, your MUFAs and your PUFAs, we want more of. So when we look at that, we'd like to see fat below 10% uh, total energy coming or from saturated fat um, uh, types, but we can see that it's up to 13 to 14%. So way below where we want to see it or way above, sorry, where we'd want to see it. 
And then we go on to salt. Now, I know salt isn't related to energy um, balance, but it is also related to, I suppose, high blood pressure and also a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And we both know those are high. Um, and we'd like to see that below six grams per day. But again, we see that above where we'd like to see it in terms of males and females across two different population groups there in adults. And we can see the same patterns emerging in other population groups, not only adults, we can see it in our children and in our teens as well. So how do we make the changes or what do we do in terms of making changes during food environment to change this? Well, there's already policy around that in terms of a policy that was put out in um, back in the uh, 20, uh, it was the, for the 2016 to 2025 policy, and it was a healthy weight for Ireland, the obesity policy and action plan, and it was to be implemented by the obesity policy implementation oversight group. And at that point, um, the government wanted to do something strategically for obesity to try and reduce that prevalence that we were seeing. So that increased prevalence we were seeing in different population groups. And they had different working groups within that group, that obesity policy implementation oversight group. And they had one in relation to healthy eating that relates to the, the permit, the healthy eating guidelines that we have. And I'm not going to go into that today. And also in terms of healthcare. What I really want to focus is on food reformulation. So food reformulation relates to making our foods healthier. And in that policy, it noted that change in the environment in terms of reformulation is one of the most important policy actions for helping prevent overweight and obesity. So what is food reformulation? So food reformulation is the process of altering the processing or actual composition of that food or beverage product. And it's in order to do that, or to do that, it's to improve its nutritional profile or to reduce its content of ingredients or nutrients of concern. And that's the WHO definition. And they state that food reformulation contribute to ensuring access to safe and nutritious food for all and shifting towards healthier and sustainable consumption patterns. So how do we do this? Well, reformulation, we really focus on three nutrients here. Um, we can focus on others as well, but I think if we look at where we're getting where our, our energy sources are or where our issues are, we can see that salt, fat and sugar deserve attention. And reformulation is the process of changing them, food and beverages. And usually what we see is we're trying to reduce it. So you may see it in terms of reduction or low fat options in terms of, of sausages. Um, but you might see that reformulation happening in terms of a reduction in salt and bread. But we can do this. But how do we do it in terms of what food should be focused on and what are the priority nutrients in that food? So where should our focus be in an iris context? Well, we do what we do is look at what the dietary patterns are for our Irish population. So we can go back to look at those surveys that we've conducted to look at what are people eating and analyzing the major contributors to what people are eating in terms of the target nutrients. So if we look, for example, at saturated fat, what are the major foods that contribute to saturated fat in our population groups? So not just in adults, but also in children and preschool children and uh, adolescents and older adults across the board. And what foods should we focus on? And that's some of the analysis that we've done. Uh, so we looked at in terms of where our major contributors are. And we can look at it in terms of the orange categories here. Um, for example, the biscuit crackers, cakes, pastries and buns and soups and sauces. And we know that they are major contributors to the diets of all population groups in terms of total fat, saturated fat, sugar and sodium. So we know we can actually make changes there in terms of that. We also know in the purple here that savoury snacks and meat and products, sausages, bacon and ham, for example, are major contributors to total fat, saturated fat and sodium or salt within the diets of that population as well. So these are what we call priority foods that potentially uh, reformulation could happen in. So these are just examples. So I'm going to, to leave you over to Sinead to take you into this into a bit more detail. Thank you, Bridge. I'm going to share my screen. Now. So my name's Sinead and I'm the Food Reformulation Task Force Manager. And as Lorraine mentioned in the introduction, um, I'm also a PhD candidate in the Institute of Food and Health at UCD. 
And I started researching the area of food reformulation and the retail food environment in 2019. Um, and taking on the role as food reformulation manager at the FSAI, I've been able to translate some of my research findings into practice when implementing the roadmap for food product reformulation. So as Breach outlined in Ireland, um, we have a programme for food reformulation and it's under a roadmap for food product reformulation in Ireland. The roadmap for food product reformulation um, in Ireland was developed by a subgroup of the Obesity Policy Implementation Oversight Group. And it outlines that the food industry um, it calls on the food industry to reduce the sugar content of um, foods by 20%, saturated fat content by 10%, salt content by 10%, and calorie content by 20%. And so what does this look like? If we look at um, foods on the market in 2017 and um, still on the market in 2022, um, for example, one crisp product saw a reduction of salt content um, by 1.7 grams. A yogurt product on the market um, saw a reduction in sugar content by 2.1 grams. And a breakfast cereal product on the market saw a sugar reduction of um, almost 12 grams. And the aim in a food reformulation program is to see those types of reductions, not just in one or two products, but in a much broader scale across food categories that are significant contributors to these nutrients of public health concern, as Breege outlined. A roadmap for food product reformulation is implemented in a much wider policy context. So as Breege outlined, the Obesity Policy and Action Plan was published in 2016, and it includes a range of measures to prevent um, obesity in the Irish population, one of which is around reformulation, but also other measures such as sugar sweetened drinks tax or a voluntary code for non-broadcast media and product placement in supermarkets, the development and updating of food-based dietary guidelines, and the development and updating of nutritional standards in care, early learning and education settings. Food reformulation isn't new in the Irish context. So in Ireland, we've been implementing reformulation programs since 2003 and started off with a salt reduction program. And when the Obesity Policy and Action Plan was published in 2016, it indicated that um, a broader program of reformulation would begin in Ireland to look at other nutrients such as sugar, saturated fat and energy. A subgroup of the Obesity Policy Implementation Oversight Group was formed in 2018 to develop that roadmap. And while that roadmap development was happening at EU level, a regulation came into place for trans fat elimination in the food supply, and that's currently um, being enforced. And in 2021, a roadmap for food product reformulation was published, and that's the roadmap that outlines the reformulation strategy for Ireland that we're currently implementing. To implement the roadmap, a food reformulation task force was established and the food reformulation task force for Ireland is a strategic partnership between the FSAI and Healthy Ireland. And the role of the task force is to implement the actions outlined in the roadmap to drive and monitor food industry progress in achieving um, the ambitions outlined in the roadmap to complete stakeholder engagement and to um, undertake information dissemination. Across Ireland, there's strong support from consumers to improve the nutrient content of the pre-packed food supply. Um, a study undertaken by or commissioned by Safe Food and published in 2022 found that 89% of consumers in Ireland support the idea of government working with the industry to improve the nutritional content of processed packaged foods. And that's what the Food Reformulation Task Force is doing. So one of the first roles of the task force was to identify the food categories to be prioritized for food reformulation and to outline their reformulation targets. Firstly, we um, commissioned a review of the um, IUNA National Consumption Surveys to identify the food categories for prioritization for reformulation 
based on the fact that they were notable contributors to energy, sugar, saturated fat and salt in the Irish population's diets, and also that they lended themselves to being reformulated. And this process resulted in the identification of 40 priority food categories. Not all categories are targeted for every um, nutrient. Um, they're targeted for the nutrients that they're significant contributors to. So for example, for salt, there's 25 priority food categories. And for saturated fat, there's 16 priority food categories. The roadmap also outlined that the task force would develop sugar and or reformulation targets for commercially available baby and toddler foods. And the task force undertook a process to identify sugar and salt reduction um, targets for commercially available baby and toddler foods in Ireland, and they've been published the purpose of um, these targets is to address the fact that research undertaken by the FSAI since 2012 found um, baby and toddler food products on the Irish market high in um, sugar and salt and that were inappropriate for the diets of infants and young children. So to address that issue around appropriateness, the task force has also um, requested that food product manufacturers shift their product portfolios to appropriate baby foods and away from inappropriate baby and toddler foods. And inappropriate baby and toddler foods are defined as those that don't meet the reformulation targets or that mimic top shelf uh, foods on the children's food pyramid um, and are high in fat, sugar and salt. And retailers have also been asked to reduce the shelf space available to inappropriate baby and toddler foods. The task force has been given the role to work with the food service sector. So the food service sector um, is food outlets such as pubs, takeaways, restaurants, um, pubs that serve food, takeaways and restaurants and to improve the nutrient content of the foods that we eat out of home. Um, so the first area we've looked at is pizza, and that's because a Board B a report found that pizza is the most popular option for home delivery in the Irish context. Um, a survey of pizzas sold on the Irish market in 2023 found that um, pizza was high in salt and all pizzas surveyed exceeded um, the WHO recommended daily intake of salt of five grams a day. So using the data collected in 2023, um, we developed maximum per serving salt targets for pizza in the food service sector. And they are outlined in the report shown here. Finally, we've developed draft energy and target nutrient thresholds for use in new product development. And this, um, these uh, thresholds are currently published for consultation on the FSAI website um, up until the 19th of September. So one of the key roles of the task force is to monitor progress in achieving the reformulation targets. And as they say, what gets measured gets done. So we report progress on an annual basis in our progress reports, and these reports outline our progress in implementing the roadmap, as well as progress of in reformulation of priority food categories, and they're available on the FSAI website. As I mentioned, in Ireland, we've been implementing um, a salt reduction program um, since 2000 and three. Well, we've been monitoring it since 2003. Um, and we have 20 years of salt monitoring data um, for uh, pre-packed foods. And what we have seen is between 2003 and 2013, while the FSAI was directly implementing the salt reduction program, we saw nice steady declines in the salt content of pre-packed foods that were notable contributors to salt in the diet. But after about 2013, we saw a plateau in the salt reduction or in some cases an increase. So um, as the task force, we've been engaging with the food industry to um, reignite and to iterate the importance of salt reformulation um, in the Irish food supply. 
The reductions in the salt content of food in Ireland since 2003 has translated into reductions in population um, dietary intakes of salt, which is really good news. So we can see that the purpose of reformulation, which is to reduce dietary, in ultimately reduce dietary intake of these nutrients, has been effective in relation to salt. An analysis commissioned by the task force and completed by MTU um, on the National Adults Nutrition Survey 1 and 2 found that between 2008 and 2022, um, there was a reduction of 1.3 grams per day of salt intake in women and a reduction um, of 2.1 grams per day of salt intake in men. So this is good news, but there's still more work to be done. We also participate um, and contribute to international um, studies and approaches on reformulation. And one um, such um, study is the Joint Action Best Remap. And this looked at, uh, one element of that study was looking at the nutritional composition of foods um, across Europe. And in this um, quite busy graph, you can see that in across Australia, Belgium, Estonia, France, Germany, Hungary, Ireland and Romania, the salt content in bread was actually one of the lowest in Ireland. So again, we can see that across Europe, our reformulation efforts are having, uh, when we compare our, our um, nutrient content in foods, our reformulation efforts are having an effect in Ireland because we have one of the lowest salt contents in bread in relation to the countries shown here. An important role um, of our work is stakeholder engagement and communications and to really um, encourage the food industry to participate in this reformulation program and to reformulate their food products. And we do this following um, multiple um, stakeholder engagement activities. Um, on an ongoing basis, we meet with leading food manufacturers, um, trade groups and industry representative groups, retailers, caterers. Um, we publish regularly on our website, which is available on our webpage on the FSAI website. Um, and we publish reports, updates, new information, national supports to assist in reformulation there. We also organize and host um, events such as webinars and workshops um, and we undertake um, social media campaigns to raise awareness of the targets and the purpose of this reformulation program and consultations. So we're taking on board stakeholder feedback before um, targets are finalized. As I mentioned, we also conduct international collaboration and um, we work, we attend and contribute to um, re networks on sugar, calorie and salt reduction um, that are coordinated by the WHO. And we also contribute to European wide research projects in relation to reformulation. And this ensures our reformulation program that we're implementing in Ireland takes on board and follows best practice. So if you're interested to be kept up to date um, on food reformulation in the Irish context, you can contact us on the email address here, foodreformulation at fsai.ie, and we will add you um, to our um, network, which we send intermittent updates on um, the work and progress of food reformulation in Ireland. So thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you very much um, to both our speakers. It is really nice combination. It's really nice to see why we need a food formulation from the, the National Service data presented by Breach. And then it's really great to see what, what's actually being done um, by, by Sinead. So we're, with that, we're going to open for questions. And I would encourage you to put your um, questions in the Q&A session. And then we'll try go through as many as, as we can. Um, maybe just to to start with, I might just kick off and and maybe quickly ask um um are are there any negatives or things that 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 could be ne negative in terms of of reformulation? Could ask you maybe both have a, a quick comment on that. I'll I'll start. Well, I should need, um. Yeah. I I think in terms of reformulation, it's, and I just like to say it, it's difficult to reformulation. I don't think it's the easiest thing to do for the food industry. 
Um, and what we can see is terms of reformulation, especially when it comes to sugar and fat, that you can see reduction in one, but maybe more of another added in to compensate. Um, and we need to be careful. And I suppose that the food industry knows this in terms of it, but to be careful that you aren't just altering one and then having a negative effect on the other. Uh, and we know this and we can call it a, a fat sugar seesaw that we see this effect. So I think we it can be to, to be careful in terms of elements like that. Um, yeah, so there can be negatives, but they are known. And I think they are the food industry is working on that in terms of trying to, to reduce it in a way that doesn't have those uh, negative effects. And I suppose to, to build on that then, Lorraine, um, a, a potential, um, it's maybe not so much a negative of a reformulation program itself, but it's it's in how we approach reformulation. So um, reformulation can be a result of another lever like nutrient profiling or front to pack nutrition labeling or taxation, or it can be a reformulation program as a whole. And having a, a broad reformulation program while those other targeted measures are being implemented is important because it lets us capture what's happening across the food supply as we're targeting certain nutrients such as the sugar sweetened drinks tax for example um, and then I suppose finally there are some reports in relation to dietary compensation um, following you know the removal of some nutrients from um, certain food products so that um, yes a food product might be lower in a nutrient but potentially um, because of because that's understood and known, um, someone can compensate and maybe consume more of that nutrient from from a different source. Very good. And then and then the, I'm kind of going to to um, join two or three questions that I see coming in in, in a similar team here, and that's really. Um, is is it mandatory for um, food producers, food industry to do to do this reformulation? And then linked to that, are you getting any pushback from from industry in ter in terms of reformulation? Thanks, Lorraine. Um, so our current reformulation program is voluntary, um, but the roadmap does outline that if sufficient progress isn't seen during the period of 2015 to 2025, that um, mandatory legal measures will be considered. So right now we're implementing a voluntary reformulation program. In relation to pushback, um, we are actually seeing really good and strong engagement and the engagement building over the years. So the task force was um, initially um, established in 2022. And when we first started publishing and communicating the approach, there were concerns and a lot of questions and clarifications needed. But now that I suppose our approach and the the reason why we're doing what we're doing and what we're asking the food industry to do is really well understood. Um, we do get very positive engagement from those who are engaging. But, you know, we can't say that the all of the food industry um, is is engaging. Yeah, but it's but it's it's I guess it's a work in progress, as you as you mentioned through, throughout um, exactly. throughout the talk. And then do, as, as a, I guess a result of this, um, do we have concrete evidence that that actually this formulation can actually make a difference? Well, I suppose um, internationally, there is evidence to show that reformulation is effective in reducing dietary intakes um, for um, trans fat and salt. But there's less evidence in relation to um, sugar and saturated fat. And so it will take time to build that evidence base for Ireland. But the example I showed there um, in relation to the reductions in salt intake um, it, between 2008 and 2022, following the reductions of salt um, in the food supply, I think is a good example of how silent reformulations can really improve um, dietary quality. Breed, I don't know if you want to. No, I, I just I totally agree, and I think it's really nice when we did the the second adult survey that Nans too. And we were able to, and that was measured through urinary analysis. So it was, it was actually looking at the status. So it's a kind of a really good reflection that we were seeing a, a decrease in salt and sodium. 
Um, and I think it's 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 a good example to to show that because when we looked at changes elsewhere, we couldn't really see it when we look at total fat or saturated fat um, across two surveys. We're, we weren't really getting the, the change that we want to see, that reduction, but we were really seeing it with in terms of salt. So, it, you know, the, the reformulation was having an effect. Um, now, it may be other components as well that were having an effect, but definitely I think that the reformulation um, was a positive self, a positive step in terms of sodium. And, and it'd be great if we can see that now with, you know, more engagement in terms of this uh, task force as well and the work it's going to do yeah and, and then leading on to that is a very interesting question in terms of, of food labels and if there's any work being done in terms of, of food labels and showing how much reduction or reformulation has taken place um, for those things such as salt and sugar etc i can start breach um yeah. Yeah. um so in Food labels um, are regulated under a European regulation. And so that provides mandatory and voluntary requirements across the European Union. Um, and they're also in relation to claims like reduced sugar, reduced salt. That's also regulated across the EU um, under the nutrition and health claims legislation. So retail or manufacturers and retailers can um, put front to pack labels on their products to communicate um, the, I suppose, nutritional content on the front. It's already on the back of pack and it can be put on the front of pack on a voluntary basis following the requirements in the legislation. But currently there's no mandatory requirement to do that. Um, it was outlined in the EU farm to fork strategy that a mandatory and um, uh, front to pack nutrition label for the whole of Europe would be um, considered, but that's still a work in progress. Um, and in relation to claims, a claim can only be made if um, a certain level of reduction is required, is is uh, takes place and that reduction is higher than what we're currently asking them to do so um for sugar it would have to be a 30 percent reduction in order to make the claim and for salt a 25 percent reduction and um, so in order to make those claims yeah there's very significant reductions required um, and if those level of reductions aren't taking place then the industry can't communicate through a claim on pack that the reformulations are happening And yeah, that's that that's very clear. And I guess that's really good to to try and understand like that the, the, the background to those food labels and, and what needs to go on them. Um there's another question then here which is really interesting and it's asking um do food reformulation interventions take um cultural aspects into account and do they affect and and, and second to that then do they have a knock on effect on price? I don't know, there's uh, who would like to, to start on that? I'm trying to think in terms of cultural effects. Yeah. What, what I, I'm wondering what they mean in terms of cultural effects. I suppose when we when we looked at what to prioritize, uh, we did it across, you know, the different surveys that we've done. And they're nationally representative surveys of the total populations. Now we looked at the different surveys in terms of the different age groups. So we've looked at older adults, adults, you know, adolescents, preschool children and children, and, you know, combined all of that data to look at the, the main, I suppose, foods that, uh, you know, should be prioritized that are contributing to the target nutrients that we want to see the reductions in. Um, so there, there obviously we have, you know, the foods within that, but I, I, I'm not under, I, I don't know whether if we've taken any other considerations in, I don't know, Sinead. And in terms of cost, I suppose that's a huge implication for our industry. And I, I don't know whether that has come back from the food industry in terms of cost, Sinead. Yeah. So I think in relation to the, the cultural aspects um, breach, definitely that would have been one of the things I would consider was cultural was how the priority food categories are identified. And then in um, Ireland, I obviously couldn't go through all of the different things we do to monitor, but we are taking an equitable monitoring approach, which means um, that we're looking at um, that food reformulations reach um, the people who need it the most um, are, are getting the most benefit from food reformulation. And one area I suppose we do have a focus on to monitor is um, 
you know, ethnic food stores to make sure that we're also capturing what's happening and not just the foods um, in the, the um, you know, our standard supermarkets that yeah. we would, would yeah. consider. And another um, aspect that we're looking at is um, measuring food reformulation in what's considered a minimum essential standard of living basket. So um, this would be the foods that make up, you know, a minimum um, standard of living uh, diet. And that's a report that's published um, uh, in, intermittently by Safe Food. And we're also monitoring the reformulation progress in those foods specifically to to, to see that it's it's reaching you know um all parts of the the population in relation to price yes uh, definitely you know the the cost um of food uh, reformulation is definitely a challenge for the food industry it's something that is raised um with us but at the same time, um, the food industry is constantly innovating and doing research and development and reformulation costs are um, absorbed into that. Um, we also have national supports for reformulation. So Enterprise Ireland um, provi can provide um, you know, funding for, for food product development and the Chagusk um, National Prepared Consumer Food Centre um, provides supports around reformulation. Um, in relation to is there an, a knock on effect on the price for the consumer, there's very little evidence around that uh, internationally. Um, but it, it, I suppose it, it, I have spoken to some experts on it and what they um, assume is happening is there, there might be a small price increase at the beginning, but as that product replaces then the, the other product that starts to level out um but the but the evidence base of that is still yeah there's still a gap there in the evidence yeah but i, I guess it's it, it we just need more time to really see that and an important aspect i guess to keep to keep an eye on and to keep and uh, make sure that 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 that, it, that it, it, we're not seeing we're, we are seeing it leveling leveling out absolutely um, Breach and I, that you you support you showed very nicely some of the food permits and there's a um, a question that's come in here asking are the food permits that are presented um, correct in terms of updated food health and health knowledge so maybe you want to talk a little bit about how the, the how they're changed and there's different ones for kids uh, kids and etc. Yeah, um, and again, I think this goes back to this is FSAI's work as well. Um, in in terms of, and it was part of that action, uh, the, the policy action plan. There was sixty different actions as part of that, and I suppose looking at the, the food based dietary guidelines and making sure that they were relevant and up to date, um, is an important part of that, and also that they were available for all different population groups because I think there was certain groups that we hadn't got food permits for we do now so i think they've done the fsai do a lot of work and look at using the food consumption data that's there and the dietary patterns that are there and updating their food-based dietary guidelines using that so they are doing that and they're continuing to do that so it, it is a work in pro progress and you know you can go on to the fsai website and they go through all of that but they, but they do update them so yeah very good and, and that's very important i guess for for the public to know that they are yeah. they are up to date and, and and that there's a lot of work goes in to keep trying to yeah. keep those to keep those up to date um and then there's a good few questions about whether the, the this information will be available afterwards so yes we do record all of them the lectures and they will be available um online in the next few days through our our social media and through our, our institute's web, website so you can get everything through there um, we do have a question that, that's that's um, come in now. It's a little bit it's a little bit different, but it's asking about calories on menus as a kind of a suite of measures used to improve the in, in food in, environment. Um, maybe I can get Sinead maybe to comment a little bit on on that. Um. Yeah, so the, the calories on, on menus is actually outlined as a priority as well in the obesity policy and action plan. Um, and currently um food businesses can push calories on their menus um voluntarily but it's not um required it's not a mandatory requirement as of yet um the FSAI did a lot of work back in around 2012, 2013 around calories on menus and developed a system called MenuCal, which is freely available to support food businesses um, to use to push calories on their menus. Very good. 
Um, I know maybe just in the in the interest of time, we might try try wrap up. Um, what I'm going to do is just ask both speakers now just to um, give a, a, a quick summary of some of the key points that they'd like our audience to take away from from tonight's lecture. Can I might start with you, Breach, if that's that's OK? OK, <laughs> <laughs> sorry for um, putting you on I the spot. <laughs> Um, I suppose to say the, the the key point, I I suppose from you know when we think about I suppose healthy foods, um, the point is that you know healthy foods do make a difference. I think it, when we th look at chronic diseases and those NCDs, you know we ourselves as consumers have a choice to make as well, and we're important in all of this. And the food environment, yes, is important, and I I think it's important to you know and I think she has done a brilliant job outlining all that has been done in terms of reformulation and what work is going on behind the scenes that we probably aren't all aware of, certainly in terms of the salt reduction. So I, I think it's important, I suppose, for us as consumers ourselves um, to, to consider our own diets and the choices we make. Um, so I'd like to, for that, I suppose, as a key message to take away. So I'll hand it over to Sinead um, for your key messages. Thanks, Breach. Um, so Currently in Ireland, we're implementing um, a broad program of food reformulation of uh, three nutrients and energy across 40 priority food categories. The program applies to manufacturers, retailers and the food service sector. And so far, consumer support is strong for reformulation and we'd like to see that continue. Um, and reformulated products um, aren't always obvious, um, but, you know, do keep an eye on the nutrition composition of the foods that you're eating by looking at the food labels. And maybe over time, you'll start to see, um, you know, the content of sugar and salt um, come down. And at the moment, while reformulation isn't um, mandatory, as Breach said, consumers, you know, um, can look at labels in of foods in the same category, you know, like yogurts or breakfast cereals and pick the one with the lower nutritional content, because there is a huge variation and a huge range of nutrient content in um, products in the same categories. Very good. Well, thank you very much to, to both of you. That was a, a fantastic lecture and it was really great to get both, both pers perspectives on it. I'd also like to thank our audience for coming tonight. Um, it was great to see so many of you attending. And, and again, thank you very much for putting all the questions into the Q&A session. Um, I didn't get to all the questions tonight, so I, I do apologise up front if I didn't get to your to your question. Um, but we do have a, a limited time for for getting for for getting through this lecture. As I mentioned earlier, tonight's lecture has been recorded and it will be available on our website in the coming days. And finally, I just want to remind you that our next talk would be on the 11th of November. And again, we're going to have two speakers. We're going to have Dr. Afrik O'Sullivan and Professor Katrina Cunningham. And they're going to talk about the a very interesting topic and timely topic on the area of bone health. And we really do hope that you'll be able to join us for that public lecture. And finally, then, just to make sure you follow us on our social platforms and there you can keep up to date with all of the recent research in food and health. Thank you very much again once more for joining us tonight and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.